Welcome, welcome, welcome to another OU Insider Under the Visor Sooners podcast. My name is Brandon Drum. I'm here with Parker Thune, and we're here to talk about spring football kicking off in a matter of five days. Yes, March 11th, spring football, the first spring practice for the University of Oklahoma kicking off. We're going to talk about some recruit. Uh, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about recruiting battles. We're going to talk about. Uh, obviously the future freaks we've talked about that a lot but we'll dive into a little bit of the list if you want that you can go over to ouinsider.com there's a huge list of it's it's loaded i'll just say it's a loaded loaded visit list as far as 25 26 goes um and then we're going to talk about some rules change changes in college football and where that we feel that's headed on top of some nil stuff and then we are going to close it out by talking some basketball as Oklahoma, you know, they got 20 wins. So they got 20 <laughs> wins. It wasn't pretty. Give it up for them. First time since 2019, baby. Five years since 20 wins. <laughs> there you go. All right. So, um, yeah, we're going to talk about all that right here on this version. But first, Parker Thune, you have a very special announcement to pay some bills. Uh, yeah, I, I think I'm supposed to read this in an Irish accent. I'm probably oh, not going. Oh. Every time I try to do an Irish accent, I end up slipping into Patty's Day. Trim on, eh? Yeah, I, I end up slipping into a <laughs> Scottish accent whenever I try to do the Irish. The Scottish is just ingrained into my brain such that I that can't, is... <laughs> I can't hang on to the Irish accent. I'll give it a try. Top of the morning to you. This oh, episode. No, no. I thought I, I swore you weren't gonna read that part of it, but go ahead. Go ahead. This episode is brought to you by the St. Patrick's Day Shamrock Shavers Manscaped. This year, don't just chase rainbows. Make your own pot of gold and groom your little leprechaun with the leaders in below-the-kilt care. Say goodbye to your clover forest with Manscaped's Lawn Mower 5.0 and let your confidence shine bright. Folks, the Lawn Mower 5.0 Ultra comes with two interchangeable next-gen skin-safe blade heads, one for a classic trim, and a new foil blade to go smooth wherever your heart desires. It's equipped with dual LED spotlights. Navigate your shamrock patch in peace. Worried you'll make a mess? Fear not. This wonder is waterproof. Shave by the misty moors under a waterfall or even during a rain dance. Its compact case makes it an ideal companion ready for any adventure or last-minute plans. Trimming the hedges in your Irish garden isn't just for below the belt. Either complete your look with Manscaped's signature Beard Hedger Pro Kit and Handyman Electric Face Shaver. You can get 20% off and free shipping with code INSIDER at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with code INSIDER at manscaped.com. This St. Patrick's Day, make sure your little hairy leprechaun is luckier than ever with Manscaped. Mm, All right. There you go. Take care of your leprechauns. That's all. There's no shot you would have made it through that ad read, Brandon. Zero yeah. shot. Zero shot. There's no. There's a reason why I went down into the phone and just kind of spaced out until I heard you closing down. Closing. Also, out folks, uh, download the Autograph app if you haven't already. You can use the link ag.fan.boomer and promo code Boomer to download the Autograph app. This week, you can use the Autograph app to get heavily discounted tickets if you're planning to go down to the Moody Center and watch OU Hoops in their regular season finale. $16 packages. You can get in the door at the Moody Center to watch OU Texas for just 16 bucks by downloading the Autograph app. Again, that link is ag.fan.boomer. I'm sorry, link.ag.fan slash boomer. Link dot ag dot fan slash boomer and use promo code boomer to download the autograph okay um this is why i wouldn't have made through made it through there because the second you said 16 dollar packages i went oh we went from little leprechaun to 16 dollar packages so <laughs> that's why i don't do the ad reads for manscape folks right that's, there <laughs> and that's why you get a lawnmower 5.0 ultra folks because your package is worth I have more one. than 16 dollars. i have one and uh hey you know i'm not gonna go there I'm, I'm done with the jokes all right um let's talk some football yeah let's talk some football so folks first i, I apologize like i may look high 
or whatever right now. I am not. My allergies, I think you look fine, Brandon. I look awful. I feel awful for my allergies right now. Um, I can only open one eye. It's really bothering me. Like fully open it. It's driving me nuts. And but anyway, spring ball starts March eleventh. Uh, today, this afternoon, Parker, you and I get to go, and Jesse get to go, and I believe Blake as well, potentially. Yeah, right? Blake's coming. Blake's coming. We'll um, the, uh, the whole crew. Four, yeah, well, four of the five main people on there, like, uh, going out there. Uh, Brian is stuck working, uh, doing his other stuff, but hey, you know what? Four of the five's good. We're going to go get to talk to the freshmen and new transfers for the first time in person. Also, we're going to get to talk to Brim Venables. We have not, I did not see Zach Alley in that email, which is unfortunate. I would love to get to talk to Zach Alley. But does does Zach Alley count as a newcomer? He absolutely does. Does he not? This is the case we got to make with Mike Alk. And the communications folks. Zach Ray Alley w. is a newcomer. Give him Mike. Chance. How are you not giving us a chance? I know that we're not the only ones that feel that way, by the way. Uh there's a large contingent of the beat that is wanting to talk to Zach Alley for obvious reasons, content, and the fact that he has not formally been introduced to the OU fan base. And so it's it is what it is. It's probably in his contract that he doesn't have to do a lot of uh media, which Remember last last year, Parker? Like it was after what week two? They just nixed the coordinator interviews. Players. Yeah, like we didn't get to talk to him ever again until post game, and that was the only time we would see him. So I found that interesting. I think that's probably the mo that's moving forward. Like you're not going to get much. Brent's going to take on a lot of the CEO kind of identity which is what he wanted to do originally. And he felt like, okay, I've got to put my hands back into the defense. And and he was obviously on another podcast. If you want to go watch it, the Oklahoma breakdown, he was on that podcast. And he talked about uh, a few things that what in the world, like why is zoom doing that? You gave a thumbs up, Brandon. And it, and it did it back to me. That's weird. Um, and he talked about how he had to stop saying yes to everything, right? Like he he was just saying yes to so much, and he was he was he was pushing himself thin as far as where he could be and what he could do, and he had to stop doing that. And and not only him, but his staff, his players, like they needed a kind of a reset. He said and. I think that's where this is coming from. And that that was the Zach Alley hire. He he wants to just CEO. Now, who here raise your hands if you believe that he's not going to have his hands in the defense? Exactly. Exactly. So I think this spring is going to be interesting to see how the dynamic goes, Parker. How they really figure out the coaching, you know, hierarchy yeah. is – is he going to be able to take a step back and let Zach Alley be that guy in front of the coach? He so far the from people I've talked to, that's what's happened is he has not been in there, and Zach Alley has been the one running everything. But we all know that we all know BV, <laughs> and he's he's not like that. Um, on top of that, there. We talked some we talked some position battles last week. But I really want to know what as far as spring, what you're most looking forward to with this team. Most looking forward to? Yeah, yes. like what are you watching? What are you most looking forward to seeing? I I the think... spring game on April 20th. Like what is what is your what's something that is like, has you excited about the spring that maybe didn't in the past? Well, I think it's just to see how ready David Stone and Jaden Jackson are. And they're not the only true freshmen that are expected to have a role for the team this fall, but obviously, especially with Jacob Lacey retiring or I'm sorry, he hasn't, I guess he hasn't officially retired, but he put out an announcement that was that all but indicated, Hey, I'm done playing football. And so 
there you're down another scholarship defensive tackle. You got Dejon Terry coming back. There's no clear answer as to who starts alongside him. You'd have to say right now the favorite is probably Grayson Halton. Ashton Sanders will be in that conversation. Marcus Strong is very inexperienced, uh, only played in one game last year. And you have Devon Sears, who, okay, he's a redshirt senior, but what has he done? He didn't even Oklahoma travel with the team last year. Yeah, not, not a whole heck of a lot. And so there is a definite window for a guy <laughs> like David Stone or a guy like Jaden Jackson to have a significant role in this defense. And I would say there is a necessity to a certain extent, because even if Grayson Halton or Ashton Sanders is that guy alongside Dejon Terry and they really emerge, okay, you're going to need more than two defensive tackles, two defensive tackles that can give you consistent snaps and good reps, good game reps. If you're going to hold up against sec offensive lines and sec rushing attacks. And so to me, I think that is the most compelling storyline this spring is okay. I, I want to see just how well Jaden Jackson and David stone stack up when the pads come on and they're going full speed alongside guys that have been in this system, two, three, even four years that's and man, I'm super stoked, super, super stoked. And we all know it's Jackson Arnold's team. There's no question about that, but the internal buzz on Michael Hawkins has been really, really strong. And this is not a shock. If this is not a shock, if you followed what Michael Hawkins did as a senior, followed the trajectory of his high school career and just his continued development over the years, uh, it it's kind of astonishing that there were recruiting services out there that still had that kid ranked as a three star at the end of the 2024 cycle, because that is not a three star. That is a dude that if push came to shove, and you needed him to operate the offense at some point in 2024. I don't know if he's everything that Jackson Arnold is and would be in that scenario, but the wheels aren't coming off if you need to utilize Michael Hawkins in 2024. At least that's the indication that has been given uh, in every conversation I've had with folks inside the building about what that kid has continued to do and how cerebrally advanced he is for a true freshman early enrollee quarterback. So really excited to see him really excited to see Eli Bowen. He's a guy that has tested really well. We've talked about that. I think, you know, it's, it's maybe a, taking the easy way out to just say, okay, like I'm excited to see the freshman, but there's a lot of reason to be really excited about this freshman class, especially because 20 of them are going to be, uh, or I'm sorry, have been with the program since January. Yeah, I, I actually probably would agree with that just because, look, we all see, we've all heard the hype of Jaden Jackson. We've all heard the hype of David Stone so far, right? Throughout winter workouts, you've heard even even bowl practices with Jaden Jackson. It was, man, that guy is special. And he was, I, I've, I've talked to people that weren't, coaches that weren't just they were just bystanders at the bowl practices and they're just like hey that dude is going to play as a freshman like he is that good so i think for me it i guess i would agree with that um and yeah you're right that it is jackson arnold's team but i'm kind of excited to see what that looks like like, what does a full version of Jackson Arnold-led team look like? Not a two-week makeshift offensive line, kind of juggling all the starters across the board on offense, defense, right? <clears throat> so what does a fully healthy, or at least, at least 95%, 98% too deep look like? with Jackson Arnold leading the way. What does he look like after 15 spring practices and 30 fall fall camp practices as the starter, getting all the reps? Not, And I'll say this. I talked to someone close to Jackson, and this was just last week. And verbatim, they said, 
look, it, it's it's one thing to show up every day, work hard, go through the workouts, go through the the coaching stations, go through all that type of stuff. But at the end of the day, you knew you weren't going to play very much because, you know, Dylan Gabriel was there and he's the starter. It's another thing to show up every day for Jackson and for him to know that it's his team. He is the leader of said team. Everybody looks to him. He's got to be vocal. He's got to put forth that effort all the time. Everybody's looking at what type of effort is our quarterback, is our leader doing on both sides of the ball. It doesn't matter. Yeah, you've got Danny Stutzman on the other side, Billy Bowman. They're going to lead the charge on the defense. But ultimately, even the defensive players are going to look across that line. They're going to go, what is our quarterback doing? How hard is he working? Is he loafing? Does he have the energy that we need from him right now? And I was told that Jackson has taken that personal, very personal. Like, this is his time. And it's very similar to what happened to him in, at Denton Geyer, right? Eli Stowers was the guy. He goes in for him, plays in the state title game, has a similar outcome where he threw several touchdowns, but he also threw several picks, right? Struggled. But at the end of the day, everybody saw what he could be. That offseason, and this is just from the coaching staff that I've talked to at Denton Geyer, you could just see a difference in him knowing that he was the guy. And his junior and senior season was just off the charts phenomenal because of it. So um, I, <clears throat> I fully expect this to be a very – I think we're going to look at it and we're going to look at these 15 practices and what we've heard, the buzz coming out of it. And I think we're going to look at uh, – during the season, we're going to look back at it and go, this is where everything came together for Jackson. And I think this is where it needs to come together for Jackson because that's great. You're going to get uh, you know, the offseason with seven-on-seven seven and all that stuff to do more. But how he starts in the spring, because it's such a grind – just like fall camp is going to roll over into how things kind of resonate with him in fall camp. So I, I to me that that's, that's something I'm excited to see. I, like you said, David stone, Jaden Jackson, can they surpass Grayson Halton as the other, you know, defensive tackle can, can Jaden Jackson be a sufficient backup for, um, Dejon Terry at the nose tackle can or does OU need to go get another defense? I'm in the mind frame, and I think that's a good question to ask. Do you think they need to go get another defensive tackle this spring out of the transfer portal? And I, I'll say this before you answer. Yeah, I don't think they need to go just get a body. I think you need yes. to get somebody that's going to come in and play. If you're not going to get somebody to come in and play, rock with what you've got because you got more talent than you've ever had on that defensive front. At least in the Venables era, certainly. Yeah. And the the way I look at it, Brandon, is kind of exactly how you look at it, especially with where the numbers situation is at. Right. They're going to have to process some guys. We've talked about this. They're going to mm -hmm. have to cut some guys from the roster. They're going to have to send some guys to the portal. And, you know, we've gone through the roster player <laughs> by player and – Tried to figure out, okay, like who who do you get rid of? You can come up with four it's or tough. five pretty easily. And after that, like there are some hard decisions that are going to have mm -hmm. to be made. Hard decisions. Now, because of that, and I, I obviously you mentioned that that's not the only reason, but that's certainly a compounding reason why it doesn't behoove you to go into the portal and get just anybody to help you at defensive tackle. It's going to have to be somebody that you believe and trust is going to play a ton of snaps for you mm -hmm. and be able to meaningfully contribute in this defense, not just take up space on the depth chart. And so, yeah, I think it's, I think honestly, it's the type of situation where you probably are best served to completely hold off on that until after spring ball. And you see not only what 
David Stone and Jaden Jackson look like over those series of practices, but also what kind of a jump Ashton Sanders has made, what kind of a jump Marcus Strong has made, whether Devon Sears is going to be somebody that has any hope of making a dent for Oklahoma this fall. So I think it's on an as needed basis. And I think you're probably going to have to wait until after the spring game to determine what the true need is. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, on the other side of the ball, you look at the offensive trenches. I think this is compelling to a lot of folks and understandably. So what does the lineup look like when Oklahoma trots out for the spring game on April 20th, who is the first team offensive line? And uh, it's it's something that we have discussed ad nauseum, Brandon. Everybody, I would hope every Sooner fan understands, knows what's going on here. They have to replace all five starters. And yeah. when Caden Green got in the transfer portal, that was the end of whatever continuity you hoped to have heading into year one in the SEC. And so it is, it is a major question mark. And the answers are there, right? The Sooners did a good job of going out in the transfer portal, finding dudes that they could – plug and play and being able to co cobble together some semblance of a lineup that is not going to be in over their heads in the SEC. And in fact, mm -hmm. could end up being quite good, but it's just a question of what that conglomeration actually looks like in practice. Yeah. Look again, talked to somebody last week um, and their overall stance on that was they think the offensive line is going to be pretty daggum good. And they weren't sunshine pumping. That was what they felt was the truth. And I was obviously like you, Parker, kind of taken aback by it. Just kind of like, whoa, what? You're that confident. Well, you expound on that a little bit. And they're like, well, let me tell you something. Fabici... Nwawu is going to be an absolute superstar. That was the first thing that came out of their mouth. They said that guy is going to, he's a certifiable, at least all, honorable all, all conference guy, honorable mention all conference guy as a, you know, first year guy in the SEC. And I said, why do you think I, I, I've heard all the good news about him? I've heard everybody loves him. Why do you say that? He's like, look, the dude never loses reps. He never loses one-on-ones. He never loses in any competition that he's in. So when it gets down to it, you can see that translating on the field. Like the competitive drive, just that will to win, that one-on-one, -on -one, the will to understand your blocking scheme and seeing it through and not making mistakes. And so... um. I found that interesting. My biggest question was, okay, who do you think is center? And without hesitation, this person said, it's Troy Everett. Without hesitation. I thought there might be a battle there. They were without hesitation, Troy Everett. Yeah, I, I, and I think there will be a battle, as with any position on Bill Beatonbow's line. Nobody's going to have anything handed to them. Um, I agree, but I, mean, I thought shoot, it was weird the confidence that they yeah. had. Well, I mean, you and, and and you, I know you remember this as well as anybody. Wanye Morris joins the team in the spring of 2021. Everybody mm -hmm. figures he's going to be the starting right tackle that fall. Turns out Bill Beatonbow would rather pull Tyrese Robinson from left guard and put him at right tackle than throw Wanye Morris in there. So was that Beatonbow Eric Swinson's senior year? Yes, it was. Yeah, yes, he played too. <laughs> Edenbo is not averse to making decisions that might be categorized as unexpected. And look, Troy Everett, there, there, there may be a little bit of a stigma with him amongst the fan base just because he was the one that Caden Green replaced. And so mm -hmm. you think Troy Everett, you think, oh, that guy got benched. Or you think about his performance again against Arizona, left something to be desired, but he was playing. Yeah, he was playing a on lot, one lot, knee. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people don't realize that. And so uh, not somebody that should be disregarded or thought little of. Now, is he going to be an all-out enforcer on the interior of Oklahoma's not, line? Maybe not. He, he, I'm not expecting him to be Creed Humphrey, but mm -hmm. I, I don't think he needs to be. Yeah. Well, look, 
Um, again, I, I just, I just, I'm like you with Troy Everett. I, 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 I've always thought that there was because I remember, remember how big a deal it was when Oklahoma got him because oh, he was huge. so good. He was a freshman All American. I mean, and he I was, think, he was bound for Virginia Tech too. Yeah. Okay. What everybody so, thought. Exactly. So here's two things. You have two freshman All Americans now in Nawewu and Everett, right? That's a good start on your interior offensive line. Obviously, Jake Sexton is going to be your left tackle. Like that is that is solidified, put in stone. Like that is your guy. And if you talk to anybody and everybody about what he's done this offseason, he's been a he's been a little dinged up. Uh here recently but it's been special like they st- it's been special like he's not dinged up to the point that he's not not going to be able to go through spring or anything at least not to this point or at least to my knowledge to this point now watch when we go venables and he's like well jake sexton's out so um <laughs> so don't hold me 100 to that but i was told that it was not a big deal i will say this um the other guard seems to be Garen Hatchett, but he's been a in a boot since he arrived, and his foot has been a problem. Um, but he's been doing rehab, and from what I'm told, he is going to be really good. Like even during the upper body or into the workouts and stuff like that, everybody's kind of enamored with him right now and what he can be. And that kind of rolls over to your right tackle and this person. And these are all just, this is all sourced information. People, people I've talked to uh, one person in particular last week. And they really believe that the battle between Spencer Brown and Michael Tarquin is going to be just good and really good for both of them. And the reason they said that is that the athleticism that, that Brown brings to the table is just off the charts. They said, it's just insane. Um, the issue, I guess, is just the lack of seeing him in the offense, right? Seeing what he can do, knowing what Bill beat him, not so much the offense, but knowing how hard Bill beat is going to be on mistakes. And so, that's where they're like, well, Michael Tarquin's not going to make a lot of mistakes as far as technical, as far as fundamental. He may not be as athletic. He may not be as talented, but he is going to be technically sound. And that's going to intrigue Bill Biedenboe, I'm told. So he said that's going to be, but he said it's going to be good for him in the stance that you're going to get the best of them this next coming year, whatever that may be. It may not be up to the standards of the fans but you, you're going to get the best of both of them, they said, because they're going to be battling that thing out. And look, there's some young guys they really like too. Um, Heath Ozeda has been, Ozeda has been playing and performing well. And mind you, they have not really gone through a lot of physical football, like one-on-ones and stuff like that. They've done some, but a lot of it's been walkthroughs and stuff like that. And I'll let I'll let you announce the tight end's last thing, but this is gonna shock all you fans. The tight end working at the one is you say his last name. Fanel. I, I don't even Oh, want to, Josh Fanuel. Fanuel. Josh Fanuel. There you go. I didn't want to butcher the last name. So it's gonna be <laughs> that's gonna be an all out brawl for that starting gig. And we already yeah. kind of got that sense, but you know, Devon Mitchell's really starting to pick it up. Uh Bauer Sharp is athletic. That's the name that I else. was brought up. That, that, athletic, that. if nothing else. Mm-hmm. It's going to be hard to tell with him until the pads come on because he's coming from the D2 ranks, right? But <clears throat> the athleticism is there. That's undeniable. Jake Roberts has the experience, uh, especially in Seth Luttrell's offense. And then Caden Helms is probably not going to participate in mm-hmm. spring ball. They will probably hold him out for – the entirety of the spring, but the expectation is that he's going to be ready to roll come the fall. You have him back in the mix. And then of course, Cade McIntyre, who we saw in limited action here and there last season. So 
there's a lot to be determined. Helms has been putting in extra work. A lot of extra work. I've been told I, like, like I'm telling you, I am telling you that's a, and I, I have no idea how he's going to be, how athletic he's going to be in comparison to what he was after dealing with what he's dealt with, with that knee. Cause it's call a spade a spade here. You deal with a knee injury of that type of severity. It is a fair question as to whether you're ever going to be the same player that you were mm-hmm. before the injury. Yeah. But if there, if there is a guy who is going to be able to put that, bury that injury, put it behind him and come back just as good, if not even better, it's Caden Helms. Because let me tell you folks, the way, and I've talked to so many folks about this, the way that he has approached the rehab process has been focused. It's been intentional. It's been relentless. His sole determination since he underwent that procedure has been to get back on the field and like <laughs> everything else has been completely irrelevant to him. Mm-hmm. He has put the blinders on. And I think part of the issue was that when he succumbed to that first knee injury, he tried to rush the rehab, probably came back or tried to come back a little bit faster, ramp things up faster than he should have. And I think that was a contributing factor to the second knee injury, the one that was more severe, obviously a complication of the first. But the lesson in that was, okay, you deal with something like this, you're going to have to check every single box. You're not going to be able to rush it along. You're going to have to be content to go at your own pace and let your body do what it needs to do to heal up and take whatever time you need to make sure that when you do come back, you are a hundred percent as opposed to 90% because right. you push things a little faster, a little further than they needed to go. And he's done all of that and really, really hoping for that kid's sake. Cause he's such a good dude. And I know people see the personal side of him all the time on the, on the, what is the podcast called? It's red dirt media. What is their podcast called? Uh, red dirt ramblings. There yeah. You red dirt. Yeah. Yeah. And such a good kid. Everybody sees that such a hard worker and he has been dealt a really, really tough hand in the injury department. One of those people that you just can't help but root for with everything he's been through. So Mm -hmm. it's my hope that he can factor into that discussion in a very big way. Once August rolls around and do not forget that is somebody that is six foot five, 225 pounds and played a lot more wide receiver in high school than he did tight end. So the athletic traits assuming they are unaffected in the long term by the knee issues are supreme. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. He, he looks, I saw him uh, several days ago, just, he was walking, you know, across the way and he looked good. He, no brace, no nothing. Um, just, he looked, he looked, he looked huge, actually. <laughs> so I mean, he's a big guy. Uh, I, and so I was told uh, you brought up Bauer Sharp, and um, that's who a lot of people feel is going to be the dude. And I was asked on OU Insider the other day in my chat, like, who are going to be the, who's going to be the three deep come the season? I said, look, I think the three deep is going to change from the start of the season to the end because and we're talking tight end folks because I think at the beginning of the year Parker I think Bauer Sharp's probably going to be number one I think you'll have Jake Roberts in there and I think you're probably looking at Josh Faneuil as like your your three because they're going to be the guys that have been healthy and the guys that have probably gotten the most reps because of spring and on, right? Like Helms isn't going to get a lot of the reps during spring because he's still coming back from his knee. Um, Mitchell is going to get reps, but he's going to be battling a lot of experienced guys that have played the position, right? Um, that said, if you were to ask me at the end of the year, I could see it being – not so much a three deep at all. And what I mean by that is 
the guys will be used as far as packages, right? And as far as scheme and, and, and personnel and what, what they feel fit, they fit best for this call or this call or this call, right? Or this formation or that formation. So you can see a lot of, as far as 11 personnel, you'll probably see a lot of Bauer Sharp and Caden Helms, right? And maybe Devon Mitchell. They go to 12, right? Or 22. I think you could see a lot of, you know, Jake Jake Roberts. You could see a lot of... Gosh, when was the last time in a non-goal line situation you saw a whole heck of a lot of 22 personnel? Exactly, but, but I mean, you, you there's maybe short yardage and stuff. Like, I think you're going to see... They're going to play. That's what I'm trying to make everybody understand. Like, I don't think... I think you're going to have a two deep and a three deep, but I don't think the... Co- the coaches are going to really abide by that as far as like, oh, well, that guy's in or this guy, then this guy. I think they're going to abide by this player fits best for this personnel and this this scheme. And against this coverage, I think they're going to be a mismatch, that type of deal. I don't think it's going to be – that's our guy. And this, it's not going to be like Stogner was out there the whole time or Brayden Willis, right? They just didn't – when those two were there, they didn't have the horses. They didn't have the horses to have other tight ends, right? Like that; those were your tight ends. There were no, there was nobody else they could really play that was w- worth anything. And that's no offense to the other guys. It's the truth. That tight end room, Parker, is so talented now. Like Bauer Sharp's a dude. Like he was wanted by Alabama and everybody else. Like they want Nick Saban. Alabama wanted him. That's. Before he retired, Mm -hmm. he was after him. Yep. So, like, that guy's a different dude. Even though he's coming from Division I AA, like, FCS, like, he's a dude. And he only played one year of tight end. But that shows you how talented he is. He was a quarterback. So, I mean, it's – I like that room. I think it's going to be a headache for Joe John because he's not going to know what to do sometimes as far as personnel goes, because he's got, you got a lot of egos in there. So it's kind of like the wide receiver room, right? With, and and I think that's a perfect segue to the other thing I heard. Dion Burks from this person's perspective is going to be that guy. He's playing Drake soup's position and he is going to be that dude. And I, I quote, that guy runs crisp routes and he is so, so fast. End quote. So maybe the fastest receiver on the team. And that's a, that's a core with Brennan Thompson. So that, that to me, that's saying something. Do you not? If Dion Burks and Dion Burks doesn't need like to, to hear that he's in the same conversation with Brennan Thompson speed wise is amazing because I think if you watch his tape from last year, you're mindful of what he did at Purdue. He doesn't necessarily need to be that fast. No, he doesn't. I don't think because he's such a complete wide receiver mm-hmm. too. Like, and that's the reason why he was so highly coveted is he's not just a speed guy, right? You think Brennan Thompson, uh, Teddy Lehman called Brennan Thompson an F-16 in this offense. And that's exactly what he is, right? You know, he's in the game. He's running down the field. That's what he's on the roster yep. to do. That's what he's really good at. But Dion Burks, man, he can, he can run everything. the whole route tree. He's not just a slot dude. He can play the outside, played a ton on the outside last year at Purdue. Mm-hmm. And it's just so exciting to think about all the personnel possibilities in this wide receiver room because Emmett Jones has stacked this thing to the brim, man. Think about it. You're in a goal to go situation. You need the trees out there. You can rock with Jaden Gibson and Nick Anderson. And maybe you throw Zion Kearney out there, or even Ivan mm-hmm. Cario. Uh, you're in a situation where it's third and long and you got to move the chains. Okay. You have Nick out there because he's your possession guy, but then you find the guys that can create separation in Burks and Jalil Farouk. And the fact that you call a possession dude that runs a four, four. Well, like that's the thing. That's so that's, it, a, that's, that's a funny that's way to put it. It's so good, man. Cause like I, and I called Dion Burks complete Nick Anderson is the epitome of mm-hmm. a complete wideout. 
and you started to see it last year. You started to see it, and he was still underutilized at times in Jeff Levy's offense. And that was one of my big critiques of Levy. For the most part, I defended him. I thought he did a good job on the whole last year as Oklahoma's offensive coordinator. But the one thing, or one of the few things that I did not like to see is it was very clear from a very early point in the season that Nick Anderson was your best wide receiver and the wide receiver that could offer you the most possibilities, I suppose, in terms of what he's able to do of his own volition. And there were still games where they didn't look his way much, if at all. He had one reception against Kansas. That can't yeah. happen. That, and that won't happen, I don't think, in South Latrell's offense, because the playmakers are going to get the ball. And what we've seen from Nick Anderson indicates he is the definition, the textbook definition of a playmaker. He's somebody that can beat you deep. We saw that time and again last year. He's somebody that can go win a jump ball. He's somebody mm -hmm. that on third down, he can go create separation from a defender and get open and move the chains. There is so much that he brings to this offense. And I think if, <laughs> honestly, if they had utilized him the way he should have been utilized last year, he's probably a thousand yard, 15 touchdown guy. As it was, he went for 810 touchdowns, which you'll take that all day long. But my expectations are sky high for that dude going into his junior year, or I'm sorry, yeah. redshirt sophomore year, because he is the most complete wide out on this roster. Yeah. So with Deion Burks, when I talk about, his speed and when that person talked about him being in they were talking football speed and obviously if they were in a race Brennan Thompson's going to probably beat him by three yards or two yards or maybe just a yard I don't know but he's going to beat Deion Burks in a, in a foot race right my point is as they said just football speed running routes they said he is in that same category of you better let it rip or he's going to outrun your throw. And the fact that somebody says that and Jackson Arnold's your quarterback, and we watched him throw an absolute 60 yard bomb to <laughs> Brendan Thompson in the Alamo Bowl is saying something, right? Like that is the type of guy you're dealing with. You saw how many times he was, Dion Burks was underthrown at Purdue. He was always having to come back or go up and get it, jump ball, uh, because he was outrunning his quarterback. And that's – when you have a couple of those guys on the team, I think Nick Anderson's a guy that can do that if you just let him rip. Just let it rip and let him go down the field. So um, Emmett, Emmett Jones just has – he's going to have a problem. There's going to be somebody that is upset about their usage this year because there's so much talent. And – Mind you, 2025 class has not arrived yet, and we've all seen what he's done recruiting in that class. Uh, four-star, four-star, top 250 kids across the board. So um, it it's just going to get better and better for the quarterbacks. And if you're a quarterback, I think you look at Oklahoma's roster, I think you've got to be sitting there smiling. Uh, Am I, is this hyperbole, Parker? Like, you look at the talent that Oklahoma has accrued at wide receiver. Ohio State, Alabama, LSU, Texas, Georgia are probably the only five that you could say are comparable in the country. Would you agree with that? Offhand, yeah. I mean, without doing a deep dive on – each of the power five schools and what they're bringing back. I would say there are very few, very few mm -hmm. programs that I can think of off the top of my head that have the top to bottom talent and depth that Emmett Jones has stockpiled at Oklahoma. Yeah. Jackson Arnold has so many weapons, mm -hmm. so many weapons. I don't even talk about a running back yet. <laughs> well, exactly, like it really is a perfect situation for Arnold and, we know he's a stud. We, I, I guess we don't know, but we figure that he doesn't necessarily need an absolutely loaded arsenal in order to have success. Right. But it is such a great 
situation for a young quarterback, a first year starter to step into when he has a running back that you would expect is going to be one of the best in the SEC, as well as a couple handcuffs that can be complementary pieces in that backfield. Mm -hmm. And then the amount of talent and diversity of abilities that he has at wide receiver. So the, the, the flip side of that, having all those weapons is that all those weapons are always in your ear. I'm open. I'm open. Throw me the ball. Throw me the ball. Throw me the ball. Why didn't you look at me here? Why didn't you do that? Like, we all know they all, the wide receivers have personalities, big personalities. If you looked at Parker and I, if you looked at Parker and I outside of the world of the podcast and Parker's persona on here, the personalities are completely, I'm the big personality and he is not. And he can, he can, he can tell you that. Like he is the big personality on this podcast and I'm cool with that. But like outside of that, I'm a very, I'm louder than you are. I like by far. So, and more boisterous. So, um, as a, it comes with territory. I played wide receiver my whole life and I'm kind of a jerk sometimes and very opinionated. And that's what wide receivers are because you have to be the play that position, even at the anybody that played that position. If you looked at their personality, they're all kind of big personalities, even at the little league all the way up because they want the ball. You have to be, you've got to go get it. You've got to be just flamboyant. It's just part of the deal to play that spot. So, and this goes back to the sixties, man, like the personalities all the way back to the sixties in the NFL all the way up. I mean, why do you, it's just what it is. And you have all those weapons. That's a lot of personalities that Jackson Arnold has to deal with a lot. But the good news is, is he's got a coach that knows how to manage that. And you, he saw that last year because Dylan Gabriel had to deal with that. There was a lot of talent, a lot of personalities. Um, so you, you just, you need that. You need that balance with the coach and the quarterback to deal with that type of stuff. On the flip side, when you look at, the running back position. I've talked about this before. I'm going to say it again. Xavier Robinson is going to play this year. Freshman. Everybody I talked to, have you seen what he's done to his body? Have you seen what he, and I have, he's my neighbor, but the dude is weighing like two, 228. And he looks like he weighs 250. And there is hardly any... Like, if you go back and watch... Parker, you've seen this. You know what I'm talking about. He was a big dude running a 4-5-40 at Carl Albert. Like, he was a fast 250-pound running back. Fast, fast. He's 228. And he looks just as big with 20% less body fat on him. Like, he is a freak. That is your short yardage back this year. I don't think that's even a question, Parker. Like, you're going to throw him out there and you're going to say, go get us two or three yards, buddy. And if you get more, good. And I think that's probably how he's going to be used. And you need that because I've also heard Javante Barnes has really picked it back up. Yeah. which He's finally healthy. And that's great to hear. Great to hear. Because... Going into 2024 with Gavin Sawchuk as the dude leaves you feeling mm -hmm. good about the state of Oklahoma's running back room. I mean, he had five straight 100 yard performances to close out the 2023 season. So we have seen, we have borne witness to the reality that Gavin Sawchuk can be a bell cow back in Oklahoma's yes. system. But you want to be able to have a change of pace. And Sam Franklin was a good pickup in the portal, but again, much like Bauer Sharp. You don't really know what you have mm -hmm. in that guy until the pads come on because he is making a substantial jump in terms of the level of competition. You've got a good idea that he's going to be pretty good. And he's going to be a guy that offers you something, but you can't know for sure. With Javante Barnes, you've seen it, right? You saw it as a true freshman. Mm -hmm. He ascended to number two on that depth chart. He was the primary change of pace guy to Eric Gray as a true freshman year one, right off the bat. Then he deals with that foot issue and injuries just kind of sidetrack his entire sophomore season. You could tell he wasn't himself and it was frustrating, right? Mm -hmm. I'm sure 
more so than anybody for Javante himself, because right. to take that kind of a step back in terms of your responsibility to be active for every single game. And yet more often than not, not even see the field on any given yeah. Saturday. It's got to be an incredibly frustrating experience. We, and we saw that with how he ran off the field last year after every game. He was a first person. Boink, he was out after they did the alma mater. Yeah. And to be honest, all things considered, if Javante Barnes had hit the transfer portal after his sophomore year, you would have you wouldn't have been that shocked. No. You would not have been surprised. Mm-hmm. If you didn't know any better about the situation, and you were just judging off of what he did, or rather what he didn't do, the opportunities that he didn't get as a sophomore, you would have figured, okay, like I get why that guy's leaving. But mm-hmm. credit to him, he committed to Oklahoma for the right reasons. Anybody who followed Oklahoma recruiting back in the 2022 cycle understood that his head was screwed on straight, and he knew what he was stepping into at Oklahoma, and he wanted to work for DeMarco Murray. He wanted to step on the practice field every single day and learn from a guy that was the NFL offensive player of the year less than a decade ago. Mm -hmm. And rather than bounce, rather than get out of Dodge and try to find a new destination, he's embraced the challenge and welcomed the competition of Oklahoma bringing in an upperclassman via the transfer portal and said, all right, come on with it. Let's do this thing. And, the early indications are that he's much closer to being the guy that he was as a freshman than the guy that he was as a sophomore. And again, if you watched who he was as a freshman and who he had the potential to be, he had a 100 yard game in a conference game at that as a true freshman, we've seen the potential from Javante Barnes. It's just been a matter of getting healthy. And if he can get healthy, you'd expect that he's going to be able to add a dimension to this offense in 2024. Is it a 50 50 split between him and Gavin Sawchuk the way that we all figured it would be in 2023? Probably not. Probably not at this point. I mean, Sawchuk has created enough separation between himself and everybody else in that room that he's going to get the lion's share, at least initially, but to have Barnes at your disposal, if you need him to add that extra dimension to your backfield is a very key piece will be a key factor for Oklahoma. Mm Mm-hmm. So, I think that if you can get, I look. I think in fans' minds, I think they see this this utopia of the Florida State game, right? Like that's what they're going to be the running back room, right? Like it's going to look like that at all times, and it's not. Like you're not going to see a 50 50 split. You're not going to see two dudes rushing for 100 yards every game. That was a special time and it really created a lot of buzz. Where even I remember our podcast back in that time, Parker, where we were, oh my gosh, the split. You're going to have two 100 yard rushers all the time. And that, the, the OU staff felt that way too. Like this is what it's going to be like. And it's going to be great with both those guys. And then the foot and then the knee with with uh Javante Barnes and the hamstring with Sawchuck and it just felt like everything was working against them. Fast forward to you know week five, six of the 2023 season, and then now Jack or Gavin Sawchuck is now that guy. He's healthy, where Javante Barnes is still kind of reeling with that knee and when he would get put in he just didn't have that burst no so like you said that to to have that back and to have just any semblance of what he was prior to all that is a huge win for OU and a huge win for Javante Barnes because I if I'm a betting man I Javante Barnes is probably your running back in 25 if Sawchuck has the season that we all expect him to have this year. Yeah. So yeah, he'll be off to the NFL after. Yeah. I, why not? I if mean, he can build off what he did. Down exactly. The stretch in 2023, man. And here's, and I'm just calling it like I see it here. Ugh, there's just, <laughs> there's not room for everybody 
in that running back stable. They're going to mm. lose somebody. I don't know who, but they'll lose somebody. If not before the 2024 season, thereafter in the transfer portal. Because just so many talented dudes and not enough snaps to go around. Kind of the same conversation that you have a wide receiver right now. Oklahoma is so loaded with top cool. skill position guys, elite skill position guys. That especially some of those dudes that haven't really had the opportunity to strut their stuff yet, mm -hmm. it's easy to see them get disenchanted with the situation. I mean, that's just that's life at well, one of the blue bloods. Well, people assume that it's going to be Caleb Hicks, and I'm going to sit here and tell you it's not. They're going to find a way for that to play one because he's talented, two because there's no way they're going to alienate anything that has to do with Den Ryan. Zero chance that they do that. that. That's stupid. Like fans, if you want to realize, if you want to figure out how we we kind of work through who we feel they're going to process, you have to look at the talent. Then you have to look at the school they came from, because at the end of the day, whether you want to believe it or not, there's politics in the right, Parker. Like there's politics in these decisions long-term affecting politics that you don't want to do. And I'm going to sit here and tell you, didn't, didn't Ryan maybe attach to Caleb Hicks, but if you talk to people behind the scenes, Caleb Hicks is going to be that guy at some point. Like he may not be number one, number one, but he's going to be a guy that gets 10 carries at some point in time. It may not be this year. It may be 25, but it's going to happen at some point. So they're going to do all they can to try to keep him. I'm just telling you, like, he is good. He's a really good player. So if they're going to – it's just going to be – Parker, I'm, like, trying to rack my brain who they would even – it's the tough decisions keep coming yeah. to mind. Like, it's going to be it's going to be rough. And I talked to somebody the other day that was like, look, I – OU's recruited so well the last three cycles that it's almost impossible to not – help out another team by just releasing somebody like you were essentially throwing a very talented person out into the ether for another program to grab. Luckily, if they do it at this time, no SEC schools can go grab them. Nope. So that's and the smart play. Gosh, you remember Brandon, you remember when folks were ready to throw DeMarco Murray to the wolves over not getting Kamar Wheaton. Mm -hmm. And now, now they're the turntables. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. All right, um, we have to touch on it because it's happening this weekend. The Future Freaks, Junior Days, taking place. We've talked about it a lot. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of talent showing up. Um, there's a new addition, new four-star 2025 wide receiver, uh, Tina Kynes out of Fort Bend Marshall in Missouri City. He's a four-star wide receiver. Like I said, 2025. He's a guy that early on, there was a he, lot of butt. He's at Marshall now? That's what it said, Fort Bend Marshall. Oh, oh, I thought he was at Decaney. Was it Decaney? Who was Fort Bend Marshall that I just read about yesterday? Maybe I'm crazy. That I couldn't tell. It's Decaney. You're right. I wrote about it. and But I also wrote a thousand different names and where they're from with the list. So I'm kind of, they're all running together on me here. Um, here it is. Yeah. He's out. He's out of the Caney Houston to Caney. Who is Fort Ben Marshall that I was writing about yesterday? I don't know. He was probably on the list of the hundred guys that I wrote. Um, it's a long yeah, it was, list. It was a long list. Yeah. When I saw yours and I saw mine, I was like, well, we have like almost double. We had 20 doubles. <laughs> <laughs> the same things. <laughs> so it's like, okay, cool. Um, but this is a guy out of Decaney that I really early on there was some buzz with him in Oklahoma, and it like went away really fast. And you didn't hear a lot about it afterwards. And I'm talking like this past summer, this past fall. Like there was a lot of buzz with Tuna Kinds in Oklahoma. And it went away like that. And when I was told that he was visiting, that shocked the crap. When you saw that, did that not shock you, the name? Just because we haven't heard it in regards to Oklahoma in, what, 
three months. Nothing. Nothing that Emmett Jones does is all that shocking at this point. It's like, oh, another blue that's chip fair. wide receiver's coming to campus. Well, that's Emmett for you. Yeah, that's fair. But I mean, like, still, there's only one spot left, and I guess I don't know. I mean, it's just there's. It's going to be interesting to see how they fill that spot. Number one, um, but so Nick Hines is going to be there. There's what four, three, four top 250 kids in 2025 that'll be there three or four three 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 top two fit three top 250 um and then four 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 stars in the 2025 class that'll be there but that's all of 25 that'll be there the rest is 26 and when you look at what they're bringing in they're bringing dudes from modern day saint john bosco from florida from shaman on Madonna, top kids from top programs in the country are Here- showing up to norman I'll read you some of them. I'll read you some of them from the 2026 class. Uh, We have. Hit the the notable ones. Jonathan Hatton. He's committed to Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. The longtime 2026 running back commit. He's going to be in town. Dutch Horisk, four-star defensive end from St. John Bosco. Mm -hmm. Uh, Caden Jones, Kiwan's son. Mm -hmm. Zayden Krempen. From Prosper, Prosper. big-time offensive lineman with north of 25 offers already. Luke Waffle, that's a fun one. His brother Uh, plays for – Owen plays for Michigan, but we'll see how that transpires. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Are you hinting, Brandon? No, I've just – there's been buzz out there for like three months with this. I I believe it when I see it, but the fact that his brother is taking visits elsewhere, like that's that's a big visit – and a lot of money spent to get from New Jersey to, and it reminds you everybody that uh, Waffle's former teammate Logan Hallen is on OU's roster, so there's some precedent set at that school with OU. And the Sooners will have a couple official visitors in June from the Hun School. Correct. Could he be another one down the road? Uh. Adam Austin and Joshua Rushing from down at Lawton Mac. Mm-hmm. Both of those kids are real good players. I saw real both good. of them this weekend, by the way. I bet you. C4. I bet you Adam Austin ends up with an OU offer here before long. I don't know about Joshua Rushing, not because he's not good enough, but just because Emmett's in such yeah. good position with so many 2026 wide receivers as it is. No, there is one that will get one. I know there is an Oklahoma guy that will get it by the name. Go ahead, from Hugo. Oh, yeah, Quincy Shelton. Quincy Shelton. He played for C4 as well. So, Uh, real quick, before we move on to that, both those guys, Quincy Shelton and Adam Austin, made unbelievable plays at this 7-on-7 up at the red zone this weekend. Um, Adam Austin doesn't look like a high school sophomore, man. No, he he is. Both both those dudes are very, very physically advanced. Yeah, like he's just filled out. He's a man right now already. Like he's 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 built like a a a, a third year college guy already. It's crazy. Quincy is not. Quincy is sticks and st- sticks and bones. But man, like he's also an amazing basketball player. So that's why. Like he's not going to have a lot of weight until he quits playing basketball on a regular basis. Great frame though. Go ahead. Taj Overton is coming. The Owasso defensive lineman. Mm-hmm. Going to be a big time kid. A uh, couple of stud running backs as well, beyond Jonathan Hatton and Javian Osborne from Forney and Rylan Morris from Honey Grove. Both Rylan of those Morris was there last walk. weekend. He is, fa- he walks like DeMarco, is built like DeMarco, runs like DeMarco. Okay, drop the future cast, Brandon. What are we like, waiting it on? It is wild. Like, I was talking to Coop and even Derek Rasmussen. I was like, if Sooner Seven guy, I was like, who is it? Like, does he not look like he DeMarco Murray the way? And I was like, yep. Like, that's who he walks like. Like, he's got like his feet out, walks on his toes, just very long legs, very long frame. Um, but he's only what? Ryland's only like 5'11, though, where DeMarco's like 6'1, 6'2. So, like, there's a significant difference in. Their height, but they just look so much alike in everything they do. Just the way they move 
in space and they can catch the ball and run routes. And he's a great running back. Like he's just a phenomenal running back. Um, what did you think of JV and Os- Osborne uh, last camp? I thought he was a star. I thought he was really good. Yeah. So I got the chance to watch him a couple times <laughs> on Friday nights this past uh well, this past fall. That's different it, than a camp. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and it was well, it was weird because he had an amazing sophomore year. Mm-hmm. An amazing sophomore year. I think he rushed for he might he might have led amazing the state freshman of Texas. year. Freshman year. It'd been freshman year, right? No, sophomore year. His last year was his sophomore year. Because he's yeah, last year was his sophomore year. Okay, so when did you see him? Back in September, October, maybe. Okay, go ahead. Um, so did you see like an outlier game or something? Or? I feel like I did because to... he, he didn't do all that much in both of the games I saw, but statistically his sophomore season was incredible. And, you know, you'd see the highlights on Twitter of him going for 250 yards, three touchdowns. It just so happened that on a couple nights I caught him, uh, his impact on the game was mitigated. But – yeah. Yeah. Statistically, one of the most impressive and productive runners in Texas high school football over the last yeah. couple of years. Yeah. No doubt. All right. Get to a few more and then we'll go to basketball real quick. Oh, that was it. I was just going to say if you want to see the rest of the visitor list, no. you'll get an opportunity to go sign up at ouinsider.com if you haven't already. And folks, I can't emphasize this enough. The reason you're going to get the best intel on recruits at ouinsider.com won't be perfect recruiting coverage is an inexact science we'll inevitably get one wrong every now and again it's impossible to get inside the head of 17 year olds but Mm -hmm. you're going to get the best recruiting intel possible from ouinsider.com and that's because we're getting out and seeing these guys face to face yep we'll be out again this week we will be in dallas for the under armor event um little dad brag uh, my boy was invited to the middle school. He's not a middle school yet, but he was invited to the middle school one. He's super excited about it. So we're going to go see how he compares to sixth, seventh and eighth graders. Um, but how cool is that little dad brag? But um, yeah, um, basketball, man, 20 wins. First off, we got to talk about the Houston game. That game was awesome. Awesome. And, and, Particularly on the heels of that, I'm just trying to think of a better phrase than what I was about to say, but I'm just going to go ahead and say it. Shit show that was against Iowa State. Yeah, not a good, not a good <laughs> basketball game. It was awful. It was awful. And I was going to say crap show, but it just crap show doesn't even give the right oomph to how bad that was. Like that was just, it was atrocious, Parker. You roll that over, and there was no ex- – my expectation was that Oklahoma was going to play it close for like five minutes, and then Houston was just going to blow them out. And in the second half, they did. They separated. I think they got 13 was the biggest lead that Houston had at one point. Yeah, they, stretched, they stretched that lead out in the second half, and I'm sitting there thinking, okay, well, it was fun while Yeah, it's over, yeah. Right? Like, yeah. here comes Houston. They're just going to pour it on from here, but – uh, credit to Porter and those boys for their resilience at uh, two really and uh, two very different games for Oklahoma on Saturday mm-hmm. in the Lloyd Noble Center. And then last night, Tuesday night against Cincinnati, two wildly different games. Obviously, Javian McCollum sat out the Cincinnati game. But if I'm impressed with anything, it's the fact that the Sooners very easily could have just laid down and died against both the Cougars and the Bearcats. Yeah. And on neither occasion did they do so. Ultimately, the way that they played on Saturday, that's a prop. That's probably a good enough effort to beat anybody in the nation, save for Houston. I think Houston's yeah. winning the national championship. I, that's how I see it. Jamal that's Shedd a, is so good. That is a different basketball team. It is incredibly impressive that Oklahoma was even able to hang with them, let alone come within one possession of beating them. But man. <laughs> That Cincinnati game last night was ugly basketball. Ugly basketball. It got a lot better like the last seven minutes of the second half, but like up to that point. They didn't make a field goal between like the 628 mark and like 90 seconds to go. Right. But like I was talking about like the the turnover, like the turnover, there were less, like it was like a turnover fest there for a while and just bad basketball. Yeah. You're going to miss. I'll, 
I'll take missing shots. Like I understand that that happens yeah. and like, that's part of it. Like you go on those streaks, cold streaks, but like down to that. When Suarez hit that shot in the corner, my wife and kids, I, I got them tickets to go down and they were sitting right in front of where it happened. And dude, he, he, he barely got it over the defender's hand. Like it was, if you're on YouTube, you can see this, but there was like, it was the, the space between the defender and the ball. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't shoot it quick enough. Which shot are you talking about? The one that put OU up by one. Oh, uh, Darthur was the one that hit that shot. Latre okay. Darthur. Darthur. Yeah. The corner three. What was, the, what was the one? No, that was in overtime, wasn't it? I thought, I thought it no, was, that was Suarez. At the end of regulation. When did Suarez hit it? That I can't remember. I have, to, I can't remember. I have the but video of it. Anyways. Major, yeah, but... Like hats off to both Rivaldo yeah. Suarez and Latre Darthur for their performances. Darthur had 18, Suarez had 16. And on a night where you didn't have JV and McCollum, you needed those two performances from those guys on senior night, which just makes it even cooler. Right. Mm -hmm. Two seniors and Mox Klons check. It was his senior night too. We had barely seen him on the floor all season and they ended up needing him. They ended up needing him to go on a seven Oh run all by himself to help dig Oklahoma out of the hole and get them back in that basketball game. Milos Uzan fouled out. There was <laughs> the best way I can say it is I, I tweeted out something similar. Sometimes you just you got to find a way to get a win that you don't really deserve. And mm -hmm. credit to Oklahoma, they played terrible basketball for much of the game against Cincinnati. But when push came to shove, they found a way to get it done down their best offensive playmaker and down their point guard. They're they're one in yeah. Milos using. So against Kansas, they were without Suarez, right? We against that is correct against. Everybody up the, over the last two weeks, they've been without Hughley. And last night they were without, uh, obviously, J.B.O. Bon, McCollum. But so I think the moral of the story is, is Hughley is a piece that OU needs very badly, and they need him back badly. Missing him, okay, you can move some things around. You can play more at the five or the four. You can rotate him. Uh, you can put uh, Northweather in there. You can throw um, Godwin in there and rotate him. You know, you've got some pieces to move. When JV on McCollum's out, it is not pretty with that offense because you saw within the first two minutes of the game, three minutes of the game, he – is every he is the engine that makes that offense run and it was rough to watch like bad bad basketball but I, look give it up to you zan even though he was in foul trouble for a good portion of the game he started to piece that offense together bit by bit and no he wasn't the leading scorer and no but i'm talking from just like an infrastructure standpoint and from just getting the ball up the court and starting to set everything up for them. At one point, that was just not happening. And they didn't, it was almost like when the shot clock got within like 12 seconds, you saw them kind of look going, okay, McCollum's not in there. We don't know what to do. We don't know what to do. And I think more Suarez and Dothart, I mean, that I think they, they played – Great basketball, great basketball, and really were the key. And I know I've hated on Godwin a lot this year. Just I have, yes. and <laughs> him and Tanner Groves are just like my my the bane of my existence. Sometimes um, there there are some occasions where Godwin just decides he's going to make a play and does it. Yeah, well, Houston. That's what I was going to go back to. What the heck, man? Where had that been all year? All year. That dude was phenomenal against Houston. Like, what is going on? Then then he went back to same old, same old Godwin against Cincinnati. Just kind of there. He's a great offensive rebounder. I'll give him that. 
But man, outside of that, he's just taking up space sometimes. And I feel so bad for saying that, but it's true. It's true. Like it's four on five. All right. So before we go any further to close this out real quick, I've got to do it. Is Porter Moser the coach at Oklahoma going into the SEC? Don't make me answer that question. Ugh. There are rumors out there, folks, just so you oh, know. Oh, yeah, and our guy Brody Lusk has had it covered for VIPs at OUinsider.com, but mm -hmm. it's hard to say. And, like, is it, it, is. Is it, is it a cop-out to say that I think a lot depends on what happens over the next two weeks? Because I think a lot no, depends on I what think happens that's, over the next I two weeks. I think that's facts. And I also think that it's – I also think that some reassurances with the new gym – and arena are also in play to keep him because from what I hear, he is very, very contentious about the issue surrounding the stalling of the new arena and promises that were made and all that type of stuff. Yep. And Which would make it sense. almost feels like he may not want to be in Norman sometimes like because of that. Like, and I don't, I think he does want to be in Norman. Let me say that. But like, there's, there's some that feel like, you know, he's always got a wandering eye because he's kind of upset with how all that has transpired in the lack of devotion towards the basketball program, if you will. So, um, I think you and I both agree that if, Moser is not the coach. It's a it's an easy easy fix, right? There's one guy for the job, one guy, and you know and that guy won't be going anywhere. Nope, it's where he now, wants to be. Yep, thirty years from now, if he's still around. Yep, he loves him some Oklahoma, and that is Kellen Sampson. So, and there's been there's been rumors that if he did come about um keep disappearing on me parker i know camera malfunction okay Apologies. i didn't know if you okay um if he if he did become it i could see a maybe a hollis pride i think i think more Qantas than hollis because hollis's family's in houston but um maybe a Qantas white ryan humphreys and then whoever else they want to bring, maybe a sister comes with him to help. I mean, like there's, there's some buzz of what could be if that took place. And that would be a heck of a staff, bro. Like a heck of a staff. So I would just, I, what I want is Alex Brown to come back and be the, the doctor. Again. <laughs> that dude was there forever, man. That's a, you always knew about him. Like he was always on the, always on the television. Alex Brown over there treating Ryan Miner or Ernie Abercrombie, you know, he's back, back in the day, man. So, uh, I would love to see that back. I wanted Kellen, I wanted Kelvin to come out and I actually, uh, texted Kellen joking with him. I was like, your dad's coming out in the blue button up in the khakis in the red tie. Right. He goes, we're there to win a game, man. It's not about, um, it's not about just looking back the whole time. And he goes, it's very important. The number one team in the country is coming in and we know we're going to get their best shot. And sure enough, they did. Sure enough, they did. So anyways, um, Kellen though, he enjoyed coming back and seeing all those people. Uh, I was talking to him after the game a little bit. It was, he said it was really, really cool. I've known him. Uh, you know, this I've known him forever. So, um, anyways, all right, that's going to do it for that version, this version of the OU Insider and the Visor Sooners podcast. If you're not a member of OU Insider, we're going to have Future Freaks covered for you. We're going to have Spring. We're going to have about 30 interviews, and there's going to be a bunch of stories up there covering. That's going to be so many interviews. Yeah, there's. We'll have them ridiculous. all. We'll, we'll have, have them all. all. OU Insider, VIP, all. We'll obviously have the videos here. On this channel, so you're gonna to want to subscribe, subscribe, subscribe if you want to if see you're watching all the on new YouTube, channels. That is. If you're watching on YouTube, we'll have them 
right here on this YouTube channel. Um, it'll be awesome. You should subscribe to it because we're going to have probably 30 interviews. If you want to sit and watch all 30, that's great. Or you can go to OU Insider VIP and we'll have VIP information behind that. And not only do we do interviews, we get to talk, meander with people, you know, get some buzz, all that type of stuff. We'll get behind the scenes stuff for you as well. What's going on, what to look forward to in the spring, what some things that team wise we're hearing, all that type of stuff. All that will be right there on OU Insider VIP as always. Plus the Future Freaks recruiting, plus the Under Armour camp where there's probably going to be 25 OU offers on hand between 25, 26, 27. Uh, we will have all that covered for you right there on OU Insider VIP. Tell you where OU stands with all the top recruits in in this region. Uh, what we thought of all the you know the the takeaways from all the the interviews, all that type of stuff. It's going to be an amazing few weeks on OU Insider with spring ball kicking off and all the interviews that we've got going. But if you don't want to do that, it's, first off, it's nine ninety nine a month or ninety nine ninety five will get you a whole year, get you all the way through the first season of the SEC, plus all the recruiting, all that type of stuff. If you sign up right now for a whole year, or you can go month to month, give us a try, give us a try, nine ninety five, dude. It is literally two coffee drinks at Starbucks, and you get a whole month. Two coffee, you get a whole month, and you get to meet mingle with thousands and thousands and thousands of. Oh, you fans. And there's a lot of people that have connections to the program that are members on our board and they bring information all the time that we don't. They say things that we can't because they're behind a fake screen name. And so they'll they'll put out into the ether rumors that they're hearing and all that type of stuff. If you want to know all that type of stuff and be in, out in front of everything, oh, you insiders where you should be. It's great. It's fun. We answer all your questions every day. We're we're talking to you guys every day. I do a chat every week. It's fun. It's a lot of fun. There's a lot of talk. There's a lot of football, a lot of basketball, a lot of softball talk, all that. We didn't even talk about the 71 streak game streak ending, which sucks. But um, yeah, and so subscribe there. Subscribe to this. Make sure you're subscribed to this YouTube if you want all of the interviews on video, Venables, and they all, all the newcomers. I think how many newcomers are there? There's like 20, right? 20 early enrollee freshmen. That doesn't count transfers. Yeah. So there could be like 30 different yeah, Like this is going to, it's going to be insane. Ugh, on this. It's going to be a lot. Make sure fun. you hit that, you know, notification button. You're going to get a lot of them. So, all right. That's going to do it for this version of the OU Insider Under the Visor Sooners podcast for Parker Thune. My name is Brandon Drum. You guys have a blessed day.